I'm going to do a little bit of the introduction and then I'll take it off, uh, give it off to Tanushri or take it forward. So, um, I mean, I'll spend a few minutes just introducing Dextrous and who we are. We're a flex workspace in Mumbai and uh, our ethos has been quite simple uh, from a perspective of really bringing design thinking to real estate models. Um, and in this case of co-working. And I think uh, for us, it's very important to design the right work environment uh, to enable people to be the best at what they do. And I think nowadays uh, it's become even more important for security of whether you want private offices or sanitized work desks um, or tech enabled meeting rooms. I think it's become even more uh, uh, paramount to have a very safe and productive office space. And that's something we've been spending a lot of time concentrating on and um, was part of our ethos even before COVID hit, quite honestly. And because of that, we've been able to see a really wide mix of professional clientele from MNCs and conglomerates and SMEs and a really sort of mix of businesses as well. Uh, you know, it could be pharmaceuticals, it could be financial services, even some NGOs and social impact companies. Um, so that's, that's really been interesting because it's a very wide gamut of people. And to engage with those uh, with that sort of network has been a very interesting thing uh, for us to explore. And um, one of the things uh, that we've come up with is sort of a core brand offering is to curate conversations that can really possibly shape our community, our industry, and our future. So I think uh, the question of sustainability is something that's uh, quite close to us um, personally as well. Uh, and then as a company, you know, in the real estate sector, there's a lot to be learned and uh, to, to bring innovation in terms of products and design and how do you how do you actually make sustainable uh, infrastructure is a very, very large topic and it's a very complicated one. Uh, and, it, and we do need to start having dialogues about it uh, to start creating and innovating and starting looking for solutions for that. So I think it's very deeply layered in any industry and it requires us to educate ourselves and to challenge the norm because we are in this cycle of constantly just doing as it was done before, but we do need to stop and say, hey, why are we doing this? We need to question that. And then maybe there is another solution. So that pause is really important. And, um, and because we don't pause, the challenges sort of just become immense. And, uh, and that's why that need to innovate is really important. So today's conversation is exactly along those lines. It's in collaboration with Sankalp, which is one of the world's largest inclusive development platforms. And uh, it's an important part of the dialogues that we need to start having to breed those new ideas. And Sankalp, as you guys know, um, is a fantastic initiative of the Avishkar Group, which is a global pioneer in developing impact investment ecosystems especially across Asia and Africa. Sankalp has so far successfully organized 21 amazing summits with a global network of over about 100,000 individuals, which includes government leaders and foundations, corporations, and even investors, entrepreneurs, and innovators. So it's really got a really interesting wide mix to get solutions to actually be accepted at a very, very large level as well as the small levels. So I do recommend all of those who are interested in collaborating or scaling their business, looking to make an impact with their investments or getting global recognition for your business models. I think attending the Sankalp Global Summit would be a great idea because it's uh, coming up in November between 2nd um, and the 6th. So if you're interested, you can go to their website, which is uh, sankalpforum.com and you can get more information there. Uh, last but not least, introducing our fantastic moderator which is Tanushree, uh, who is Tanushree uh, She is a sustainability uh, consultant for the textile industry with Circular Apparel Innovation Factory or CAP, which is an IntelliCAP initiative. Uh, she's also founder of Chindi, which is a cool, cool, really cool brand, but a conscious brand that looks at recycling textile waste into products uh, handmade by low income craftsmen. So really looking at a very holistic approach, looking at waste and converting that and thinking about livelihoods as well, I think um, is, a, is a fantastic idea and you should check them out. Uh, they're on chindi.in and you can check out their uh, awesome uh, apparel. Um, so over to you, uh, Tanushree, before anything else, I'll just keep chatting, but uh, looking forward <laughs> to the awesome conversation. Thanks, Rafael. Thank you. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Very, very happy to be here and uh, part of Sankal Dialogues and this fantastic partnership with uh, Dextrous. Uh, so, of course, the topic for today is uh, challenges that conscious brands face. Uh, we've, we've very intentionally put the word challenges there because we really want this to be a very candid, open conversation 
um, and discussion around what it really means to run a conscious brand, especially in today's day and age. Um, and we have these four amazing speakers here, founders of four amazing conscious brands. Um, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves so that it's not just me talking too much. Um, so uh, they're going to tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, but what I would strongly encourage everybody who is listening to us right now is please, please do participate in the conversation. This is not just about us talking at you. Um, the goal here is for us to have a very open conversation and to really answer any questions or concerns that you may have. If you're a founder, an entrepreneur, you're thinking of starting a conscious brand, you have one already. Um, if there's anything you're struggling with, these are the people, the experts who've been doing it for a number of years and have been doing it very successfully. They walk that very fine line between uh, a brand that is uh, conscious and environmentally conscious, socially conscious, but also commercially viable. So uh, any questions you have around that, please do post them in the chat um, and we'd be very happy to, to take them. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to begin with kind of an open question to each of you and would be great if each of you sort of introduces yourselves and your enterprise um, and then we can kind of start. Uh, so the first very broad open question, of course, is what is a conscious brand? And when we say a brand is conscious, what is the brand conscious of? So if you could tell us with your brand, what is your brand actually conscious of and what and, and how do you do that? So Arshia, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Arshia. Um, I run a coffee company called Black Plaza Coffee. Uh, I'm currently in office and um, I was mentioning to Tanushi that I just sort of dusted off all the coffee before getting on this call because um, we are very, very understaffed. The team is all over the city trying to cope with uh, COVID and, and everything. And so um, we're all kind of pitching in and it's all sort of hands on deck. Um, I guess I've never really thought of Black Baza Coffee as a conscious brand at all. Um, and that's partly because um, the way we envisioned the project, um, coffee was a means towards ecological and economic justice and um, the brand is and the coffee actually is is almost a byproduct of that much larger vision um, and so um, it sort of came about um, at, as, as an outcome of my PhD work actually um, because so I'm a social scientist and um, I happened to be in the Western Ghats um, of India in, a, in an area called Kurg, which happens to also be the largest coffee producing uh, district in the country. Um, and um, I was interested in questions around biodiversity and wildlife conservation. Sorry, if I could just request everyone to please keep themselves on mute um, so that we can hear the speakers. That would be great. Um, so as I was saying, you know, I was interested in questions around wildlife and biodiversity conservation, but because we're in India um, and there are, we are everywhere, people are everywhere. Um, um, I actually found the spaces between forest and, and coffee farms to be very, very porous. So often there were no clear boundaries between what was a farm that was meant to cultivate coffee and what was a forest that had been set aside for wildlife. Um, and, and in the interactions with the coffee producers um, that I was doing through my PhD fieldwork, we started exploring whether there would be a completely alternative way of growing and selling coffee. Um, um, something that in a sense placed nature and biodiversity at the center of the marketplace um, and, and where it isn't, right? I mean, we don't necessarily value that coffee can be grown under ficus trees or we don't necessarily value that coffee is grown in a place where farms share the habitat with the world's rarest primate, the lion-tailed mm. cat. And so wherever you have coffee farms in India, we have these amazingly rich biodiversity that exists as well. And then central to our project became the idea of how we could, in a sense, empower smallholder producers to make good ecological decisions about their farms, to cultivate yeah. coffee in a way that protected biodiversity. So the conscious brand actually came almost as an afterthought along with this idea of how we might do something different. 
Yeah. That's interesting because you're talking essentially about the consciousness of biodiversity first and then the brand part came second. And uh, Seher, if I could ask you to jump in here, did you have a similar journey and is that how it went for you as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the necessities, um, much like Asha, I also came from an academic perspective at first. You know, I was an environmental nerd. I thought I was going to do my uh, PhD and kind of continue to become an environmental professor. And then, you know, the best thing that happened to me actually was that I didn't get fully funded for my PhD. And I walked, uh, went on to move in the healthcare space of the World Health Organization um, in Geneva during the Ebola outbreak. And actually, while I was there, I started working on projects that also showed kind of the health impacts that our waste problem was currently having. So it actually was really great because for the first time, it made me shift gears from an environmental perspective, which was, you know, just one perspective to also kind of incorporating a healthcare perspective into the way I was looking at our waste problem. And then um, moving back to Bangalore in 2015 and working with uh, waste pickers and uh, helping on energy access uh, projects across uh, rural Karnataka, um, especially working with the waste picker community, made me kind of completely re-examine my lifestyle. And of course, it helped me to look at the social justice aspects associated with our waste problem. Um, you know, if I worked with Rehman for three months and I'm super excited that he now has access to solar lighting um, and his kids have a digital education that's being put on the slum, um, that you, I'm giving them that access. But if, um, you know, if I'm watching Rehman in the morning sort through broken glass and sanitary napkins, um, you know, what's, so I guess what was going on there. So I really kind of, that, that's kind of what happened with uh, me and I thought, um, that I wanted to just live a lifestyle that was more congruent to um, everything I stand for, whatever I, I say I value or, you know. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, Bare Necessities was completely accidental. It was more about me choosing to live a certain lifestyle that was ecologically sound and putting that special on the environment. And um, I just wanted to live a lifestyle that was just in line with these values that I've always said I cared about. And then I realized it was really hard and access not accessible um, in 2015 to find a bamboo toothbrush or a you know, miswak stick or everything kind of one marketplace. And um, the idea was to make it easy and accessible for anyone else who was looking to consume more mindfully or to let this low impact or conscious lifestyle. Amazing. So again, inspired by, you know, your background, your knowledge, how you wanted to live, and then that got turned into this movement that is Fairness Estes. Uh, Dimant, I'm going to ask you to jump in here as well. And I, and I know you have uh, some internet issues, so I'm going to ask to answer this question before you drop off again. Yeah, sorry um, about that. It's just been choppy all day. No yeah. problem. So I assume the journey for you was perhaps similar, but also you started. So of course, Demand is the founder of The Better India. Um, and then from The Better India, you are now doing uh, ecologically friendly home products called The Better Homes. Um, and so tell us a little bit about that evolution and how it went from kind of content product. Right. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, you know, our, our lens on this has been very different right from the beginning. Um, our view has been, how do you build, like, so firstly, how do you build large scale impact, right? Uh, that's been our core sort of uh, problem that we always want to solve. How do you drive large scale change? Um, and the first step towards that we believe is that you need to build a community of like-minded people who then influences the sort of the so-called outer layer who can also be influenced. And then you kind of start building this whole movement towards whatever change you're talking about, right? In this case, sustainability, but it could be anything. Uh, so that was the whole idea with which the Better India started. Um, per se, it was more about saying, how can we use the power of stories to build a movement, a collection, a community of people? Um, and, and, and then you can mobilize this community for various social causes, which is what we've been doing at the Better India in terms of the impact uh, campaigns and stuff that we run. Uh, one of the things that we started seeing very early on in uh, 2018, in fact, early 2018, is that the conversations really started shifting towards uh, what are we consuming? What are we really doing to the planet? Um, and, and consistently, we saw that content related to environment, sustainability would be the most engaged content right, across any story we did around that, that, that uh, topic, right? So we started having conversations. We took almost about uh, six months of having real conversations with our readers and stuff. And what we realized is that, well, a lot of people want to move towards conscious consumption. That really isn't a large scale presence of a brand that is quickly accessible. So today it's still, it's still in pocket. I still need to go down to a, find an organic store. Um, yeah, there you'll find some amazing brands. Uh, some of the folks are here. 
uh, but it's not as ubiquitous as you know something which is there on an Amazon and you get it right now and it's not part of the daily habit. Um, and so that's the problem that we then decided to solve. How do you really make sustainable products be prevalent and be used at a large scale? Um, and, and, and one of the causes that was actually very strong for us, uh, we, we started this whole Lake Revivals Collective, which is a, the Better India started kind of reviving lakes, we've revived one lake so far. Um, we realized that the amount of you know, water contamination that happens in this country is insane. And, and it happens because of everything, right? Uh, but, but if you look at just domestic consumption, uh, it's something that we felt strongly about in terms of what is it, what are the chemicals you're bringing in and what goes out once you've washed your you know, utensils, your floors, your laundry. And we're, we're all doing more of it uh, of late, but you're starting to see that at, at close quarters. Um, and that led to the genesis of the better home, saying that, you know, we need to bring in cleaners, which are actually eco-friendly, starting with that and make it accessible to people at scale. So that's really been the journey from why the better India, why the better home, like fundamentally the arch remains the same for us. How do you drive impact at large scale? Interesting. I'm going to come back to that point about scale and the mainstreamification of conscious brands. But, yep. uh, but first, Srinivas. Srinivas, who is the founder of this amazing Ayurvedic brand called Kriya. Uh, and you are also doing home cleaning products, but also uh, personal care products. So right. tell us a little bit about Kriya. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, you know, thank you for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, my partner, Preeti, and I started this company called Kriya about 10 years ago. And uh, it was a uh, there was no one singularity point at which we, you know, we started this company. It was a gradual evolution in how we started this company. Our background was in consumer products, you know, and uh, we, uh, for last, you know, 15 years, uh, more Preeti than me, I uh, started going organic and sustainable in our personal lives. And, you know, there came a point when we decided that what we were doing in our professional lives, where the uh, environmental issues were heading and what we were consuming personally, there was a huge, you know, divergence there. So, uh, we just took a gap here in 2009 to examine, you know, what we wanted to do with our life. And, and I, I, we did a bit of travel and thinking and all of that. And we realized that we need to uh, provide solutions, right, that are absolutely sustainable. And uh, we started asking some interesting questions, you know. So uh, Indians have been cleaning, you know, their clothes and, and you know, having, you know, great uh, skin and hair care products for, you know, millennia. What were people using before chemical products came in, right? That was the first question that we asked, and that's how uh, it started. And uh, our brand is called Kriya, and that ties in with you know the uh, the question that you asked. Uh, it means mindful action. You know what we realized was that we are not mindful of many of the small actions that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, be it doing the laundry or, or you know doing the dishes, or even the kind of products that we use. Uh, let's say a shampoo or, or you know soap, and what happens to those products? You know when it. Uh, goes into the effluent from our homes. So we started looking at natural solutions for cleaning products because we were quite appalled at the, uh, you know, pollution that was happening, especially in detergents, you know, and with the eutrophication of water and, you know, the uh, pollution of groundwater, especially in landlocked places, right? And that we have seen now, I mean, this is, I'm talking about 2010. And in 2017, 18 extra, we've seen how the lakes have started foaming over in Hyderabad and Bangalore as a partly in large part due to detergent effluent coming from uh, homes nearby. So it's a real problem, except that it's not very visible. Uh, we also started asking a very important uh, question. That's the second part of our DNA. The first part of our, of our company's DNA is that we will make environmentally sustainable products. And we look at the whole value chain, right? From sourcing to how we manufacture it, to how the consumer uses it, and what happens to the products when it's disposed by the consumer in terms of its packaging, as well as the effluent uh, that comes from the consumer's home. But the second question that we started asking was, how do I design a product? For example, if I'm, uh, let me just give an example. Just take this, uh, today we're in the middle of launching uh, makeup cleansing oil. It's a very interesting product, the latest product that we're launching today, right? What is the basis, scientific basis to make a product which is good for skin, right? So how do you say you can put these chemicals on your hair or put these chemicals on your skin? And, and that's why we're having so many issues, right? And we started looking for answers. This was obviously a larger one. We realized that we need first principles. So what we do is we bring first principles thinking into our work. And we were looking for an organizing system. And after doing much research, we realized that we have a fantastic system, which is Ayurveda, which is there in the public domain. There are very clear textbooks. There are very clear first principles. And these uh, principles and the products that come out of them and the way of life from Ayurveda have stood the test of time for millennia, right? So what we decided was, 
we need to have a clear answer when a customer asks us saying, why are you putting this ingredient into your product? How is it going to work? How are you sure there are going to be no side effects, right? And, the, and so we base our work on Ayurvedic first principles and uh, we make very traditional formats as a result. So we eschew modern formats completely. One of the huge issues in sustainability and, uh, you know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, cleaning products and uh, this thing needs to come up is the use of water. Mm. Products, your product becomes very unsustainable. And, and I think we will come back to this point later in the discussion about scale versus sustainability, right? At what, at where is yeah. that uh, point of the graph where you are, you know, talk about sustainability at scale. We yeah. completely yeah. eschew water-based products because the minute you add water, you need plastic packaging, you need uh, preservatives, you need fragrance. So, we are clear on uh, uh, those uh, sustainability elements as well as making classical Ayurvedic formats only. Because if you're going to be talking about first principles, we can't tweak a first principle to say, thoda sa adjust kar lenge, right? You can't adjust on a first principle. If an Ayurvedic textbook says, this is how you are supposed to make a Bhyanga skin oil, that's exactly it. I'm not mm -hmm. going to make it in a modern format. I'm not going to change it because you don't know what you're losing uh, when you change a classical uh, format. Also, you don't know what you're messing with. And that's one of the reasons why we're in such a huge mess. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, take an example of triclosan, right? If you see the triclosan, which is a triclosan is a chemical used in all these sanitizers, you know, common sanitizers, I won't, uh, and all common, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disinfectant liquids that we see in our home, I won't take the brand names, right? And 30, 40 years ago, they called it a miracle molecule, right? This is, this is going to change the world. And just four or five years, people are saying that, oops, sorry, we made a mistake. There are now superbugs out there. Triclosan is a mm. huge mess, right? So this came because there was no first principles thinking in making a synthetic molecule that has mm. no basis, that has no recorded track history, right? And then suddenly unleashing it, right? And we have a huge problem of antimicrobial resistance, which is not a joke, especially in uh, environments like hospitals, etc. So the mm. things that we do, and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up here, is that uh, we look at the environmental footprint of a product, so that's very important to us. And the second part of our DNA is first principles, and that's why we base our work on uh, Ayurvedic uh, principles to create products that hopefully are sustainable, as well as obviously highly effective for the customers uh, in short and long term. Amazing. So you're almost saying like we have this Bible, we have this rule book, we just need to follow it. We don't need in to the public domain. something here. In the public yeah. domain. It, it belongs, it's our treasure, you know. And that's yeah. the other thing which we're trying to do is these are Indic knowledge systems which need to be I wouldn't say protected, that's too pompous. I mean, who are we to protect it? But to cherish it, to enjoy it and apply it. You know, I mean, we really need to cherish these systems. They're outstanding systems. This is yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, but there is, so, I mean, let's get to that point about scale. Each of you have reached, uh, have kind of touched upon it at some point. And I think that's the, that's the kind of core question with a brand like this. There are changes, edits, tweaks that need to be made to make a product palatable for an end consumer, whether it's in terms of how it's packaged, whether it's in terms of how it's sold, um, you know, having an online website, for, it, for instance, inherently is, you know, the first change you make to a, to a traditional Ayurvedic product. Um, and also what's interesting about what all of you have said is it started with your values first. You were living a certain lifestyle, you had certain personal goals and ambitions, and you realized this is something that I want to kind of spread and make wider, whether it was conservation in Arshia's case, whether it was a zero waste lifestyle in Sarah's case. And so what happens when you take this kind of very personal mission and you say, I want to make this bigger, and I want it to be purist, and I want it to be commercially viable, and it should also, you know, when, when you start adding those ands, uh, what happens and how does it go from like a personal mission to a large scale, full fledged mainstream product? And how do you mainstream a personal mission? I guess is the question. Um, Dimant, do you want to, do you, would you like to start with this one? Yeah, hi guys. Um, so that's an interesting question. And, uh, you know, I've had a different view from uh, some of the thoughts that were discussed earlier. Um, for me, I think uh, the biggest thing you need to do when you have a certain value system that you believe in, is that you need to kind of take it to a, as large a scale as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, with all due constraints, of course, built in, because that's your business model. Um, and I believe you'll be doing gross injustice to that value if you do not think of scale at a velocity that really changes the landscape. So for instance, if I believe that water contamination is an issue, um, and I want people to use the products that I'm kind of making. Um, I would, I would love to see those products kind of gain that velocity as quickly as possible. Um, 
But the other school of thought, of course, has been that, you know, uh, we will do it at our pace um, and kind of take it as it comes and kind of do it as long as we are kind of, you know, doing, uh, doing it uh, the, the pace at which we want. I think, I think that serves the entrepreneur very well. But I somewhere think that it does a disservice to uh, the cause. And of course, this is a largely a learning that has been influenced uh, from the way I have been kind of building technology companies, which we really, really believe in building scale uh, because that's when you see the impact on more and more people and hence on the outcomes of what the, the, the things that your people are thinking. Uh, which, is, which is the reason why, you know, before the chat started, when we were talking about raising funds and all of that, uh, that's really the perspective as to why I would prefer kind of raising capital to drive that scale um, mm. so that you can actually get into, go deeper into the causes and kind of uh, get the velocity that you want to see the, to see the impact, right? Um, again, fundamentally, I don't think scale lends itself naturally to all business models, you know? So we need to be cognizant of that as well. Um, uh, you know, you start a restaurant, you can't think about scale before you think about profitability. It's just mm. it's endemic to that business. Uh, but when you're thinking about something like, let's say, an online commerce, right? Uh, it's imperative that you think of scale if you really want that cause and, of course, your business to kind of grow at that, at that pace. Uh, so that's my view on, uh, on, on scale. Yeah. Uh, Arsha, could I ask you to... Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. may I respond? Because, I mean, Please. we have a very different um, philosophy, in a sense. Um, um, and, and, and for us, I mean, I suppose um, the qualitative value of the process itself um, and the nature of impact we have has been very important. And, and partly that's because, I mean, we emerged as a reaction or as a response to um, what might be global sustainability mechanisms like a certification. And the idea behind the certification is very, very large scale impact, but very incremental impact. And when we looked at how these very large scale sustainability mechanisms were being implemented for the Indian context, we found that that incremental impact didn't really do the ground level any kind of justice. So, for example, um, in a sense, I mean, I, I sometimes I'm a bit cynical of large scale kind of programs because I feel they ask too little. They yeah. ask too little of consumers. They ask too little of other stakeholders. Um, and, and the beauty has been in really looking at whether we can completely change it as a response to what that alternative is, right? Yeah. And so for us, I mean, you know, one easy way to have gone about it would have been to look at just one parameter. And biodiversity is literally the most compli complex parameter. If we looked at something like whether, you know, coffee was organic or not, we already had that in the market. Right. And we could have just gone and looked <laughs> at bringing as many producers under that organic fold certification if we wanted to but mm. for us that wasn't enough and for producers it wasn't enough because a lot of coffee growers a lot of indigenous communities tribal communities already do and want to continue to do much more than what large-scale sustainability mechanisms want so if i if i want to go beyond that organic certification and also look at how i'm conserving moths how i'm conserving woodpeckers, how I'm conserving earthworms in the soil, that alternative that exists doesn't allow me to do that and doesn't mm. give me the and visibility and value uh, that I'd like. So, I mean, we've always approached it as not necessary. I mean, I understand um, the idea of disservice and if we could be, be you know, impact more people and impact larger areas, why not? I understand that. But for us, in some sense, it's been a trade-off to look at the quality of impact as well and the process that we, we take on to, to achieve that impact. Fabulous point. That is you know, so I'm beautifully great. put. Srinivas, please. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at, I mean, a couple of things and taking off from what both Dhimant and Ashia said. And we've been doing this for you know about 10 years now and i'd uh, say that uh, uh, scale which is uh, you know impacting a large number of people 
versus what Arshia said, which is quality of impact, depth of impact in a person's life or in her case, the whole process that she talked about. Uh, you know, they need not be divorce. I mean, like say, if you have, uh, let's say on the x-axis, you have, you know, scale and on the y-axis, you have impact, which is I'm talking about deep impact in a person's life. The two need not be divorce. It, it seems initially that, uh, uh, you know, you need to make a trade-off at some point in time to get the velocity for scale. Or you say, I'm going to stick to my guns, be in this place and make the huge possible impact. But what has happened uh, in the last 10 years, and there have been customers who've been with us, you know, from day one, and we're really thankful to them. And we're able to see a massive qualitative shift in the mindset that they have, in the quality of their lives, in the number of people they are impacting because they have literally uh, become Korea ambassadors without us talking to them in explicit terms. And when you talk about making the mainstream uh, mainstreaming of the personal mission, they get our mission as much as we do, right? But that's taken time, and that's happened. That ha that's happening because we focused on how useful can we be to a customer. How can we make sure that we don't violate any of the first principles that we uh, set out to, you know, ten years later after, uh, you know, laying the in year one. And what we see is over a period of time is the there is a very, very dramatic mindset shift in the consumers that who, who stay with you for some time. You know, your mission becomes their mission. And when they spread it, there is no advertising in the world, you know, that can uh, talk as well as a passionate brand ambassador who says, look, I like these guys. I've seen them for a number of years. I know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. This is going to make a change. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time, but at some point in time, it will also lend itself to scale because the quality of your impact is so deep, so transformative, uh, you know, that it, it will really, really spread because that, then it becomes yeah. an idea that, that spreads really well, you know. Uh, I yeah. always had concerns about superficial level impact, uh, you know, on a large number of customers. And uh, this is where we're coming from. And, we are, and it, this is a long process, right? But uh, it, it, it's possible to have some scale and lots of deep impact. Hmm. I mean, uh, Sahar, I guess the question for you, the follow-up question for this would also be, I feel like what you're saying is in some ways, each of you is redefining what you mean by scale also, right? So, for instance, what Srinivas is saying is I'm not looking at scale as, as breadth, but maybe as depth. Um, or that I'm not looking at scale as the number of customers I'm reaching, but the multiplier effect that those that the few customers I have and, and that they are having. Um, and so do you feel similarly about scale or, you know, do you think of it the way a regular, a regular brand would or what's your kind of take on that? Yeah. Well, um, I think fundamentally the FMCG industry that we, like we know it hasn't seen any innovation for the past 30 years, right? Everything is packaged in plastic. Everything is loaded with chemicals. Sure, it's made consumption easy and accessible. It's allowed women to enter the workforce uh, because we don't have to make everything from scratch, whether it's pickle or sambar or whatever, right? So I think um, plastic has done a lot to actually bring women out, uh, out to the workforce. So, and also we need to understand the cultural context of why plastic emerged. But anyway, this, this is, that's a talk for another time. But I do Very think- interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was basically used in the world wars. And then the industries didn't know what to do, and then they thought the FMCG industry was a fast way to move it. So anyway, we can go on uh, we're talking about the history of uh, plastic and how it entered the, this industry as we know it. But I think this industry needs a dramatic shift. Um, you know, at the rate at which we're going, of course, we all know we're in the largest global garbage crisis of our lifetime. And we know the amount of microplastics that is in our food and water and the soil in which we're then trying to, you know, grow our food on. Um, so I think for us at Venus Estes, it was basically uh, building small nano communities around getting people excited about sustainability, but also explaining what has gone on, what are the complexities, why are we, because I'm an environmental nerd, I'm a policy nerd, um, so, you're, so my, it came from an awareness perspective. It came from basically talking about environmental justice issues at 2015, talking about you know, zero waste in 2015, where I literally had to start my talk with zero waste. Now I don't need to do that anymore. Everyone knows what zero waste means. And that is amazing. I think the idea for Ben Necessities is to make zero waste the norm and not the exception. I don't care if there are 900 other brands out there who are doing exactly the same thing. That's okay. That's our mission solved. If there is less plastic entering our oceans and landfills, hell yeah, that's what we want. I don't want us to be the most profitable McDonald's over there. Like, 
So I think um, scale is important in the sense of building small nano communities around sustainability, uh, building small enterprises that are mushrooming, that are supporting local economy, that care about community health and justice. And, uh, and I think coronavirus has really shown us the power of that and the need of that to strengthen local economy. So imagine if all of us from walking distance um, had um, maybe a Kirana store only or whatever, if we had soap, shampoo, food, everything in a completely package free manner. It's actually not that hard because literally our nani start these eyes and energies all used to live like that. The bazaars are the uh, epitome of the Indian culture, right? So in a way, we're not advocating for something that is so radical or so crazy or so bizarre. It's literally just advocating to going back to what we used to do. Um, so for us, we started with a lot of talks and workshops because if you have a product that people don't know why you should use a bamboo toothbrush. Bamboo is the fastest growing plant in the world. It takes only three weeks to grow completely full size versus your plastic toothbrush that will take anywhere from 500 to 700 years to start from disintegrating, will never fully do. So we thought knowledge is power. And I think I come from that perspective because also my mom really cares about education. I mean, that's been a, a huge central point of how I grew up. So knowledge has always been power. So I think, um, you know, doing these little talks and workshops, teaching people how to make our own recipes, when we're very transparent about all of our recipes, we do multiple talks and workshops. Um, so to encourage people to do it themselves, um, because if they can do it themselves without any plastic and um, are learning something, maybe they teach it to other people, that's kind of the mission of NSSDs, to mainstream it and uh, basically make um, sustainability or zero waste or conscious consumption the norm and not the exception. And then when you talk about impact also, I think we try and articulate, you know, we care about our social impact a lot as well as my necessities. We don't articulate that as much, you won't find that on our website, but we cover everyone's salary, uh, school fees, all their kids' school fees, the entire teams, um, they all have an additional learning. Um, so for example, Shapri, who started on the manufacturing team, is now head of manufacturing. She took a, a tally in Excel and computer skills. Like, so we you know incorporate into that into who into who we are as an enterprise. We up everyone's healthcare during the coronavirus to make sure everyone is covered um, above and beyond what they already had. Um, so you know I think you have to live your values not just in the products you're producing but how you are internally, how you treat people. You need to walk the talk. Um, and I think at the trustees, you know, the mission was not something that I did. It was a Seher value thing. We literally sat around this very table in my mom's garage and came up with it together and wrote on it in this whiteboard. So I think, you know, um, it's not about one person, it's about getting multiple people together who believe in this. And then I think all of the talks and workshops that we've done, like we've done literally about 200 over the past uh, few years. And I think all of those nano communities that we built are literally um, part of making this movement and sharing knowledge. And They've added up. Yeah, amazing. There's so much hustle that goes into this, that's fabulous. Uh, I think this question has come up in the in the chat from two different people, uh, Savdi and Lakshmi, I think both, because we're talking about mainstreaming, right? And uh, ultimately we are brands, we are consumer facing brands, that's a choice that you have made, which means you ultimately rely on the consumer to give you money to buy that product, whether because they are bought into the sustainability narrative, whether they believe in the values or whether they just love the product for what it is. Um, price point therefore becomes just the pivotal thing on which everything rests and there is a general perception among consumers and and, and please tell me if you think this is true or not uh, conscious products sustainable products are more expensive than regular products yes okay i understand there is and you know there is this angle of environmental impact and sure i'd love to be able to afford this but i simply can't um, especially when it comes to something that I buy every day, like a floor cleaner, for instance, or a bath soap, you know, products that some of you sell. Um, Demand, would you like to start and would you like to kind of give us your take on price point? Uh, so, I mean, no doubt that the, these products are expensive. Uh, they do not come from factories. They, uh, they, they have a very different research process. Um, like, you know, in fact, what Srinivas was saying, I think Srinivas and Preeti, the amazing work that they've been doing. Uh, it doesn't happen in a, in a mass scale factory production level, right? Um, uh, also, also, the problem is that because of so much of mainstreaming of what you currently see the existing alternatives, there's a certain consumer behavior that is set in. So if you want to really change someone from buying a a bottle, uh, you know, a bottled plastic detergent as compared to a powder in a cardboard box, uh, which is made out of recycled paper, it does, it definitely is a step forward from the consumer. So you're, you're, you are expecting that. 
Uh, and since not enough consumers are going to come forward, you need to factor in your margins and, of course, have the pricing go up. But my sense is this. Um, I think we all, uh, especially, you know, the, the panel that is here, um, I think we have to look at the markets in terms of segments. And, and we have to start with certain segments first. Um, and personally, I believe that a segmented market itself is large enough for us to thrive um, and wait until the market, the, the second, third, fourth segment starts evolving and kind of moving towards this. And while we wait for that, we will be able to bring prices down because there will be so much of innovation and technology changes that will keep happening. For instance, one of the things that we've, we've learned, uh, you know, uh, just the cost of distribution has gone down so, so tremendously. We sell only on our website. Um, mm. and, uh, and, and even running an e-commerce venture four years ago, five years ago, the costs were prohibitive at that time. And you had to charge a consumer a little bit um, of money, but now you don't, it's just commoditized, right? So your, that, that whole cost has come down. And I think the more we have adoption, that's one part, but the more we wait for the market to segment itself, uh, we, will, uh, we will see the cost coming down. We just need to hang in there, um, hang in there and kind of, uh, you know, do a great job with the segment we're catering to right now. Yeah, so it's like a cultural shift that has to happen, which takes that amount of time to happen and wait in it for the long haul. Asha, what yeah. about you? Um, is, your, is your coffee more expensive than a sort of regular uh, coffee brand out there? Well, I mean, in a sense, coffee is already a bit segmented. So the stuff that gets swept off the floor of a hulla or a mill goes into that granuly type of stuff that you put in hot water and milk that dissolves, which we won't name. Um, but that's stuff that gets swept off the floor. And so a lot of the coffee that we have when we segregate it in quality, so even our stuff that gets swept off the floor <laughs> goes into those. Um, and then, you know, the different beans of different qualities are, are roasted and so on differently. So in a sense, it's already a bit segmented. But I was also going to respond and say that actually, you know, in the consumer space we have and this, this sort of products and commodities we have access to, we really are not used to paying the full cost of what something costs. Right. Um, and yeah. there's a range of externalities, uh, environmental externalities that we don't pay for. We don't pay for polluting, uh, whether, you know, whether it's air pollution, we don't pay for the plastic straws that end up in the ocean. We don't pay for many, many of the things. And we're yeah. certainly not paying for changing the climate as yet. We're not paying a cost for changing the climate. Um, and we're not paying a cost for the soil that's being depleted of nutrients and so on and so forth. So when we, when we look at the bag of, you know, of, of what our coffee is, sometimes it's just a truer representation of what it actually costs to grow yeah. and trade something in a fair way. Um, and then, of course, we have you know, 40% of what our bag of coffee costs is actually back to the producer. And so that's in some sense why something is more expensive, which is also that in addition to environmental costs, we're not paying the social costs of what, what you know, um, developing different um, products yeah. is like. Yeah, and we've seen this in the fashion industry, for instance, right? We work with CIF and the fashion industry over time has gotten customers used to paying 200 or 300 rupees for a t-shirt, whereas that's not actually the cost of a t-shirt. It is actually yeah. supposed to be much higher. And what a customer understands as a regular price point is already just quite low at a base yeah. level. Um, Srinivas Seher would yeah. love to get your... So, uh, the thing about price is that number of things are happening, which we've seen over the last few years, and I'll, I'll talk about that, is if you see the traditional FMCG industry, you know, uh, they have this perception of being affordable, etc. But that's actually not true. And consumers are going to figure it out soon. What they keep doing is giving you smaller and smaller packs, which you see, right? In the end, you're just consuming less for more of for the same price. So it's actually prices going up. If you actually see the cost of a chemical detergent uh, for a, per kilo in 2010 when we started versus now it's 2.5x, right? Our price, our MRP has been the same since May 11th, 2011, right? So we've kept the same, it's possible, you know, for consumers over a period of time to figure out that, you know, in the regular supermarket, uh, you know, aisles, all you're getting is smaller and smaller, uh, you know, quantities at slightly higher prices. There is only this illusion of uh, affordability there. Then there are going to be few of these difficult black swan events like COVID, et cetera, 
you know, uh, like what Asha was speaking about, the the cost of you know the environment which we are not looking at. At some point in time, I mean, what has happened with COVID, uh, you know, leads me to believe that you could have government in intervention, the government coming and regulating certain industries, right, and, and saying who's going to pay for this cost, right? Uh, that seems unlikely now, but it could happen. But also consumers are waking up and saying that, look, we need to, you know, account for these things, especially post-COVID, right? People are having time to think. They are really thinking about what is it that matters to me in life, right? What is it that I really, really want? That's, that's at, at one end of uh, the price discussion. At the other end, there are a number of brands that you do greenwashing, and that's something that we didn't talk about yet, is they just say the words organic, fair trade, certified, you know? All of those lists go on and on and on about those, and their price, pr prices are extraordinarily high, right? Only in part due to the uh, money that they paid for certification, right? Certification is very yeah. expensive. That's what drives up cost at a certain level, but not to the levels that certain uh, certified organic brands do. So uh, consumers are going to figure that out at some point in time, right? I think the question is, how do you keep on uh, showing value to the customer at the price point that you're doing? And what, what we are doing is, uh, how, how we kind of try to solve this problem is that we go and we have a number of products, right? And we go and give consumers a, a, these a very good problem solution products. That's what we do in Skin and Hack. We solve extremely difficult problems, right? So they then they see the value in what we've uh, given to them. And then, then start looking at the other products that goes. You need to have a huge basket of offerings and, and give something to the customer where they finally understand that, look, these guys are solving extremely difficult problems that matter to me, right? This price is justified, and in many cases, actually, uh, our prices are also, in, I mean, in, in our category, are actually lower than, uh, you know, the regular oh. products. It's not that we are not expensive also. We are affordable. In some cases, we are a little bit more premium, right? So you you have some lead product that helps the consumer understand the price value equation in an unforgettable way. Then they will come around to the whole thing and uh, what, you know, uh, uh, even Arsha said about the cost of, uh, you know, things that we don't know about, right? Who's going to uh, look at the environmental cost? So a number of things are going to happen. There is, there has to be at some point in time, some push either from, uh, you know, uh, consumer, uh, citizen activist groups as well, right? About let's say drinking water or environment. Somebody is going to say, I mean, it will it will come to a head at some point in time, right? Yeah. Uh, but there are a number of ways of uh, conveying value to a, a customer at whatever price point you're there. Yeah, true. And and Sahar, just uh, to bring you in here also on the price point conversation, but also it sounds like what everyone is also saying is this is kind of, we're in, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe this price seems high right now, but you know, the economy is going to change, culture is going to change, system, systems are going to change, and so this is all going to kind of balance out. Mm -hmm. But having said that, we're here and now, today, this month, we need to make a profit at the end of the month. Um, and the product is really expensive. And, you know, there's also this pandemic and, and people are kind of tight with their purse strings. How, how do you deal with something like that? Yeah, um, I mean, I echo all of your sentiments, um, but I also think um, customers are smart. So you just be real, be authentic to who you are, communicate that and articulate that. And I think customers are smart enough to, um, you know, make their own decisions. Um, so I think there's also a, definitely an awakening, especially in the pandemic. People are becoming so much more mindful. We're all kind of uh, rekindling intimacy with our homes, our kitchen, what we're wearing, what we're eating. Uh, we have to take out our trash by ourselves. So everyone, I think there is on a, um, you know, like from an internal level, like there is something that is awakening in everyone during this time. Um, so I think that's been pretty encouraging. Um, and in terms of... Um, uh, the price is being high right now. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, over time, I totally agree. Um, you know, we're going to kind of have pricing that will kind of incorporate environmental externalities that will be true and um, which will incorporate social justice, environmental justice, uh, biodiversity, conservation, and all of these metrics that we now talk about. Um, I do think the certification game is like really scary. I was exploring all of this and I reached out to Arsha actually a couple of um, maybe a month ago, uh, because there's a labyrinth and they are so expensive. And you, you as, a, as a producer, I'm confused how to navigate all of that. Um, so, you know, I think, and there are, and each country has its own uh, certification and there, there are just so many. So what do you even want to go for? So, um, I, I don't know. I, and right now I just think you just be authentic and who you are and hopefully consumers kind of see that. Um, and like I that. think, yeah. yeah, that's, that's basically where I'm at. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, this hour has passed so quickly and there were so many other things that I wish we could have spoken about. But, but I think the last thing that I would ask everyone to just 
kind of very quickly respond to is the conversation we were having earlier around raising investment, which is the other aspect of scale, right? So there's customers and sales, um, but then there's also raising funds to kind of make this happen and a capital injection. Um, so I think of the four of you, I think Demant and uh, Sehel have actually raised investments uh, with small, <laughs> with investors. <laughs> And, and I believe Asha and Srinivas have a kind of slightly different take on that. So I guess Dimant and Seher, if I could, if, if we kind of divide you into these two groups and just have like a little bit of a quick, we have like about five minutes left. Uh, Dimant and Seher, your take on investment, but also I guess for, for you, the particular question would be, you are a value driven organization. You are rooted in certain values. You are all obviously not looking at profit as the end goal. You know it will come or you believe. Um, how do you talk to an investor about that who is really just looking at return on investment? Um, well, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Okay, yeah, so honestly, I uh, didn't raise investment for a really long time, um, not out of choice, but because people were just like, you're a 24 year old. Um, um, and, you know, that just didn't happen for a long time. And then I just uh, concentrated on building the brand. And uh, eventually, it kind of happened. Uh, in a way that I wasn't actually outwardly seeking investment. Um, but I will say what the most important thing is to make sure your partners are totally aligned with your values and your mission. So actually our lead investor is an impact investor. So I think there is a lot of value alignment there. And the other two are just kind of more individual investors, people who um, I love and admire and respect, and they all kind of came together and they all have kind of completely different uh, skill sets. So, um, you know, just just make sure it, people have told me this before and it's cliche but it is like a marriage so think about it more long term and people who you really kind of align with in terms of your values yeah and you attract your tribe so it sounds like that's what happens with you as well yeah definitely <laughs> demand how about you what is that conversation what is a values conversation like with an investor yeah you know i just want to give a quick context right so from 2008 2008 is when the better day started as a side project as a as a movement that we wanted to kind of spearhead from there till 2015, that's about seven years, we bootstrapped it completely, uh, funding it out of our you know, savings and stuff like that. And we got to a certain sort of a scale. Um, and, and then by 2015 is when we realized one very important thing that when you're in the development sector, impact sector, um, and when we just looked around, every platform that existed, like if you look at even just content platforms, um, they're read by the same people in the development sector. So what was really happening was that this was just basically going out and convincing people who were already convinced about these issues, right? So the, so the challenge became, how are you taking this to the man outside, out there, who really is not keeping all of this in his radar uh, when he's going about his day-to-day -day work? And so, so we decided that this, you know, scale becomes important. Um, but scale becomes important once you have nailed down the business and impact focus already in your business model which basically means that the more your business grows, the more your impact can get, get generated. Once you've done that, you kind of go uh, and, and raise more capital. Uh, you know, in 2015, after running for seven years, we were read by about a million, two million people. We raised capital and in two years, we reached out to over 50 million people, that's over 60 million people that read us now every month. So that's a significant growth that you can get if you get the right kind of capital. Now that caveat is very important because you need to get investors who truly believe in your cause, and I think we live in wonderful times that there's this whole breed of, you know, investors called impact investors, right? Um, IntelliCap was one of the sort of early sort of uh, advocates of what we've, we've, we've been doing. Um, so I think you definitely have a great bunch of investors out there who don't only care about the returns, uh, who really care about the impact that you're generating. In fact, a lot of these impact funds um, have the, some of, one or more of the SDGs as their goals for their yeah. sort of investors, right? Um, so if you're able to get a, a, uh, anyone to kind of invest who is aligned with your cause, I think the journey is, uh, is incredible because then you can really scale your uh, cause and take it to as many people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Just want to highlight, reiterate that part, that nailing down your business and impact sort of connection uh, is super critical before you raise capital because you should at never point come in uh, come into a fork with saying, hey, should I do this because it's good as the business or should I do this because it's good for impact? But the moment yeah. you're kind of having those conversations, then you still, still haven't nailed down the connection between impact and business. So Absolutely. I would say, I would say do that as the first phase and then, yeah, I mean, you raise capital to drive the scale that you want. Such a good tip. I mean, I think that would be like one really concrete takeaway from this conversation for, for anyone who's an entrepreneur looking at, at raising investment, you know, 
you can't have that decoupling of your impact and your business model as as you scale your impact needs to go up as well um really really good point iman uh, shrinivas and arshi of course on the on the other side of the fence not raised investment and i think don't want to either and and yeah. why and tell us about that is arshi going first no no go ahead okay so uh, our take uh, my partner prithvi and i is completely uh, you know uh, different from what some of the people are speaking so we first uh, wrote down the principles uh, on which we want to build our company and the choices that we are going to make and the decisions that we are uh, going to take and the way we uh, we're going to treat our uh, customers right and we realize that these choices are very very odd uh, they might not uh, go fly past what 99.9% of vcs you and we come from similar backgrounds we understand what a vc wants and those those requirements from a vc are also all very uh, reasonable i mean if a person is funded we will have to, so we felt that there, there would be a number of compromises if we went to and uh, the thing that we wanted to do was to make sure that our brand is there 100 years later so that's our starting point so what do, what decisions do i take today to ensure that our brand exists in exactly the same spirit with the same principles 100 years later and when we were drop plotting that graph uh, equity investments from outsiders just did not uh, uh, you know figure in i mean we, we, people have always been giving feelers to us in terms of you know hey you do you guys want investment number of our customers are also uh, you know are our vcs and uh, and uh, investors etc and they are very good people they are, you know they are impact investors they are patient capital and all of that but our choices are still outlier in terms of how we want to run the company how we want to treat the customers it's it's not for everyone and in every single case what we have seen is that if you take investment it all gravitates towards the mean there are no outliers and what happens is that if you see the investment space i mean not just in social you can see outside the, it's the same uh, bunch of people with the same money chasing all companies i mean you can plot uh, the investors you know within 3 to 4 uh, you know uh, connections will be having the same vcs what they're all doing is they're converging towards i mean at the end there'll be only two brands left there'll be some sort of duopoly some sort of monopoly somewhere and that's what is happening in all industries right small brands in 15 years 20 years 25 years stops you know it's going to get merged with the biggest brand so it's always there yeah. it's like you know only the two biggest ones can survive in that model and that's not wrong yeah. that's the nature of that beast right yeah and we don't want to be in that race we want to run our own race and we want to be sure uh, that to tell our customers that we are going to be there for their grandchildren as well in the same form and in that conversation this didn't uh, you know work out for us that's our take amazing and i guess we are still looking for investors who are willing to measure impact in terms of the kind of horn bills we see on the farm and the number of leopards we have passing through the farm and we just haven't found those kinds of investors yet um <laughs> but, you know on a, on a i mean that's a serious note but as on an equally serious note again i guess is that we currently now work with um 650 smallholder producers and we're trying more and more about how decisions are made completely participatory and mm. so decisions about the long term strategy of where this company goes or this organization goes has to really be also something that producers really feel for um and and that might take time um but you know i was i'm i'm going to stop there because i'm such a huge admirer of sahar and i wanted to just sort of say um and ask you a question actually because i feel like i've seen my city change since bear necessities has been around just in terms of the number of steel straws i see in different cafes and i know that you've been there somewhere telling them happy <laughs> um and and it's so kind of unique to see a cityscape change because of someone you know or a brand you know so that's so cool but i was i was curious because you you folks have made now a shift um from from moving to doing workshops and more um other kinds of things so i was just kind of curious about how that happened and what's next and and you know kind of yeah, yeah. to be honest workshops has been going on from day 1 
Um, so from 2015, 20, maybe even 2014. Uh, so that, that was kind of like a way for anyone who's willing to listen to me talk about trash or waste or sustainability. I was just like, come on over. So I think um, the workshops has been part of our DNA. We, um, we do almost two to four every month. Um, and then I think, you know, honestly, what really helped us was that we came up with the online course like late January. And honestly, during the lockdown, it was a lifesaver. All people, every, the entire team salaries, everything were covered because of that. Uh, so I think I'm realizing the power of um, kind of de-risking a little by having a combination of uh, physical products, but also an online community that might live even if the products are unable to be you know, in their hands because they continue to advocate that lifestyle or do a little bioenzyme workshop or a composting workshop in their community through things that they learned at the Zero Waste and 30 course. Um, and all of those are not revenue generating projects at the NSSDs. Like we're in fact advocating for them to buy a daily dump car. Um, so I think, um, I, I think I love your brand. I think just being authentic and like like who you are and all, like all of the other brands here, I think, uh, and then like relying on each other and being real and sharing all of our lessons. So, um, you know, you don't do, make the same mistakes I do. It can save you some time and energy. <laughs> so I think that's what makes this ecosystem like. Amazing. Awesome. I think similar, uh, this is similar to what Srinivas was saying earlier also about uh, you've been do running workshops to teach people how to make their own home care products and you found that that didn't actually cannibalize on your sales. That actually got you more uh, sort of enthusiasts and, and, and champions. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, also, I think also realizing that we all should kind of be self-reliant. So if, even if we don't have access to buy anything, we'll know how to do, do things ourselves. So I think that's kind of the essence of Zero Waste in 30. I absolutely love this. And this is such an inspiring conversation. I wish we could go on. I know we have like come to the end of our time and we're a little over in fact. So if anyone needs to leave, please go ahead. But uh, I think for me, the big takeaway from this has been, you know, when you're running a conscious brand, just, just the way you started is different. You, you don't start with the idea of profit. You start with the idea of what is your cause? What is your mission? What are you passionate about? Um, and I think Srinivas, you were saying this earlier, you know, would you do this if you weren't paid for it? So it's yeah. like they say character is who you are when no one's watching. So a conscious brand is, is a brand that's doing conscious when no one's watching. And, and that's what I think each of you are doing really well. Um, any other questions, any particular questions about your enterprises, anyone who's here who wants to continue this conversation? You know, I think we've, everyone has been posting their, their links um, on the side, on the chat. So please do follow each of these brands. Please do reach out to us if you want to continue this conversation. Um, and, and speak further with them. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I, I wish we had another hour to do this, but it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm.